Corey, what's good? Hey, what's up, my brother? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Do you want me to uh, put in some headphones? Does my on or is it okay? Up to you. You can be you can be in headphones on or just just like that. You can if you can turn the video on, that would be the best, just so people can see you. Okay. Let me see. I thought my video was on. I can see myself. Yeah, it's uh, kind of on. Yeah, now now we can see you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, let's wait for a couple more minutes. There were 20 people registered, and we just, since you're the first one, it's now we got to figure it out on the fly uh, because gotcha. with all the registration thing. But as of now, there were 20 people registered, and I was expecting it to be like 20 to 30 people. Maybe they'll tune cool. in later, but I'll I'll be checking. I'll be checking the number of people later too. So uh, this live stream is going to be recorded, and later I'll post it on YouTube just so people can rewatch it. Awesome, that- awesome. What's up, everybody? How y'all doing? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, can you just give a quick introduction about yourself? Sure, sure. Uh, like. My man Bossy said, my name is Corey Harris. Um, it's crazy. Me and Bossy have known each other for, I think, the last seven or eight years. Um, Bossy yeah. was a, a really good player who I, I met uh, back in the day when I was a skill development coach in Atlanta, running my own business called Student of the Game Training Co. And uh, we stayed connected, obviously, throughout the years. Now I'm an uh, assistant as well as a skill coach for the CBA uh, Beijing Royal Fighters um, under head coach Stefan Marbury and assistant coach Jay Humphrey. So I've lived here in China uh, for the past two years, um, but I've done skill development and all types of teaching um, all over America and uh, worked with, you know, players from all over the world. So um, it's always an honor and a pleasure to have the chance to speak with anybody, you know, to grow the game. But hopefully I can help you guys out, you know, with your video breakdowns and answer any questions you might have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the name of your company just speaks for itself, student of the game. Yes, sir. Always a student. <laughs> Never consider myself the master. Always trying to learn. Yep. Same thing out here. All right. So I just wanted to go straight in the topic. Uh, so I wanted to talk about keys for efficient uh, video breakdown. And to start with, can you just tell me what are the keys in your opinion for a successful team video session just based on your experience? So before I even get too much in depth into breaking down a a video or any type of film, I will say this. If you guys can find someone who has experience in that area, whether it be a professional uh, coach like a scout, someone who does recruiting and he has to do player analysis, or even if you watch things like uh, Draft Express, I want to share with you guys a a good resource. Um, Bossy might know of him as well. His Mm -hmm. name is Mike Smith. Mike Schmidt, I think I said it right, but he uh, yeah, Mike started a, yeah, he, he runs Draft Express, and now he's actually, um, he's over, like, player analysis for, uh, I want to say, NBA on ESPN. Um, he works with, you know, college hoopers who are getting ready to go to the NBA, and he's the one who kind of, you know, determines their draft stock, right, the, the, mm-hmm. whether they fall in the lottery, they go in the second round. He even does, like, live video sessions with them on television on espn you can view them on youtube so i would like to share my screen with you guys Mm -hmm. see if i can i don't know if i can boss you might have to uh change the settings but i'll do that later um but his yeah while you while you talking i'll i'll go ahead and see how you can do it sure but his i'll give everyone his twitter handle right now um you can follow mike schmidt at m-i-k-e that's mike underscore S-C-H-M-I-T-Z on Twitter, Mike Schmidt, M-I-K-E underscore S-C-H-M-I-T-Z, Mike Schmidt. And uh, I cold called Mike um, maybe five or six years ago. I was still playing college basketball, and I just wanted to learn about uh, film breakdowns. I wanted to teach myself how to evaluate film because it's something that I considered an asset for my basketball training services. I wanted to also be able to evaluate my players and, and teach them the game via their game film. So uh, I reached out to him way before, you know, he was like super big on ESPN, and, you know, was doing the draft combine and he messaged me 
right back. Like, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. And so we began a dialogue, began talking, and he was actually the one to give me a lot of valuable information. Um, one mm -hmm. other person that you should look up is, you uh, can, if you haven't you heard of You can share the screen now. Try okay. it. Awesome. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right. Turn my microphone on. Okay. Cool. So, what is Twitter? Can everybody see? Yep. All right. So, this is Mike Schmidt. Um, as you can see, he's got the uh, sports center backdrop behind him. Make sure you follow him, check him out. Um, here's an example of one of his film sessions, right, that he does with athletes. And just seeing how other coaches conversate with an athlete, like their demeanor, the way they formulate questions, the way that they point out that player's weaknesses and strengths, that will kind of give you a feel and a flow for how you can talk to a player. So it's all about your delivery, it's your confidence when you're talking to a player. Um, I got to turn my VPN on, but anyway, you got to check that out on your own time. I don't want to spend too much time because that's mm -hmm. stuff that you can find out on your own. Um, another great resource is Drew Handling. Um, he's the CEO of Pure Sweat. I, mm -hmm. Everybody should know Drew Handling by this point. And, uh, you know, he does great film analysis as well. And so if you can get in touch or just kind of follow those guys, you'll learn a lot. So that's just some uh, preliminary stuff to try to help mm -hmm. you guys out <laughs> and give you some information. I always want to give people information. I don't want to just, you know, inspire you and just fill you up with a lot of, you know, feel good stuff. I want to give you things that you can actually use. So hope that helps. Uh, but to go mm -hmm. back to your question, Bossy, keys for successful team video session. Uh, number one, the most important thing is preparedness. You must be prepared before you walk into a film session. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I've sat through film sessions as a former player in college, and I've actually watched my coach watch the game film for the first time as we were watching the film with him <laughs> for the first time. And there's nothing more like just stressful and it, it drives you insane as a hooper because you don't really want to sit and listen to someone give you a bunch of like negatives, right? Like you did this wrong. You did that wrong. How could you make that pass? Are you stupid? You know, look, look what you did here. Like none of, none of us want to sit through that. So as a coach, you don't want your players to feel that same way. So be prepared. If your film session is going to be 20 minutes and here's my opinion, your preparedness or your time to prepare should be twice as long. So for a 20 minute mm -hmm. film session, for me to sit down with like our starting point guard, Kyle Fogg, or our rookie point guard, Drake, we have film sessions this week. I'll take twice of whatever the amount of time I think I'm going to spend with them. So if it's a five minute video, it might take 10 minutes, but it might take 30. So at least I'm, I'm saying double for you guys. If you have to watch a full mm -hmm. game, then you're going to have to sit through the duration of that film to pick out the nuances and the things that you want the players to recognize. And it also gives you confidence. If you're prepared, your players can feel that. And then now they're ready to listen. But if they see you fumbling and bumbling, you know, through your, it's, it's almost like a presentation, like a sales pitch. They're not going to yeah. be tuned in. So do your work before. Um, the next most important thing, in my opinion, is to have a central focus, have a theme. So if I'm sitting down and I'm breaking uh, down some film over our last game, we played against the Beijing Ducks, Jeremy Lin as their starting point guard. And our main focus, our theme was to stop Jeremy Lin. It was to force him to have to, you know, make tough plays, shoot tough shots, you know, and go left, you know, force him to make decisions and pick and roll because he just wants to get downhill. You know, he's not the most cerebral player in the world. So, if that was our theme going into that game, then that's now also a theme possibly for our film session after the game. Because we want to make sure that we're focusing on the things that we were supposed to do well, the things that we wanted to make sure we covered up if we had weaknesses going into that game. And we track that. We, did we execute? Did we, you know, maintain a certain ratio between assists and turnovers, whatever. So that's kind of what, if I'm a coach doing a film session with the team, I want to make sure I'm not just pointing out every single bad thing, every single thing that I come across. I want to have a theme. So I would mm -hmm. say no more than no more than two to three focuses. So if you have a hour long film session, 
for that hour, what are the two to three most important things that you saw as a coach while watching the film that keep occurring? If the weak side defense is late and it just seemed to keep happening over the course of that game, then that's one of your themes. That's one of your focuses. If a player missed an assignment one time, though, it's probably not that important for you to spend 10, 15, 20 minutes yelling at that player for blowing an assignment or blowing a coverage or forgetting to rotate and tag the roller. Like that, mm -hmm. that's something you can pull that player to the side and just tell them privately or just make a small note of it that for the next practice. Um, I don't know the levels of all the coaches here, but even if you're a mi middle school coach, high school coach, college coach, an aspiring coach, maybe you're not a coach, maybe you're a skill development trainer, you still want to have a, a focus. You still want to have a theme so that when you sit down with that player, you, they know what to expect. You can even state it at the beginning. Uh, I want to show you guys, I'll, I'll share my screen one more time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Show you guys an example. And this is a, a great tool. <laughs> Technology is crazy. <laughs> Man, for real. It is nuts. All right, so get in here. So this is a, a film, it's like a player evaluation film that I put together for one of our bigs, right? At the halfway point of the season, I wanted to give every player on the team a video, as well as I gave it to our head coach, Steph, Stephon Marbury, just some areas they could focus on. So the first half of the video is all their strengths. But here, weaknesses, you can see that I'm giving him a theme. So two themes. Mm -hmm. He needs to show consistency, more energy, have a higher motive on the de defensive end. Uh, second thing, needs to develop his confidence and rhythm within the low post and mid post area. So now every clip that comes after this picture, this screenshot, it sticks with those two things. See, so I don't want to just show him everything he does bad. You can see him number 13 under the basket, not boxing out, not showing any type of effort. Another shot goes up, team gets another offensive rebound. Look, he lets this guy just go right past him. So now it's what he's looking for. He knows what he's watching for, rotates. But he lets the guy get into his chest. Boom. Right? So we're sticking with his low post defense. That's mm -hmm. our thing. That's our focus. We're not all over the place. Now we're not wasting time. And, and so, I love the details that you had. There was uh, arm bar. This yeah, that detail. Yeah. Just using those external cues. So... So when you guys are, are, are giving a player film or giving a team film, just the fact that you come in with a focus helps the player to stay focused, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, I, I want you to think about this. How smart were some of you? Because maybe you guys were players before you became coaches. Or may some, maybe some of you in this chat, in this Zoom call, are actually players. I don't know. But we all know as players, we knew more than what our coaches gave us credit for sometimes. We're smart. Right. We, we know when we make mistakes. We know, oh, I should have, you know, rotated there or, man, I should have made a bounce pass instead of an air pass. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're always going to make the right decisions because we know what's right. That's why the game is a game of mistakes. It's a, it's a game of runs. So when you're conducting a film session, you have to make sure that you don't disrespect the intelligence of your players, that you don't talk to them as if they're babies like their children, you know what I mean? Especially the higher the level is, like if you work with pros, talking to a grown man or a grown woman, like they're ignorant, is not a good way to teach them anything because they all have stories and they've all had to work hard and do so many different things just to even get on this level that they're on now. So when you approach them with something that can potentially help them, it's good to include them, make it conversational. Ask them, what do you see? What do you see right here? Or what were you thinking when you made this play? What did you think was open? Oh, <laughs> I don't know what that was. But, I don't know. Me you know, either. Low, low. I don't know. Okay. Kate, Burn, make, yeah. make sure you got your microphones on mute. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's muted besides me and you. Okay. Okay. 
Well, we're this, good. This Hopefully the Chinese thing. government isn't hacking into uh, my Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> but we're all good. So you, if you want the information to stick, include the player in the conversation. Uh, teaching is twofold, right? So if mm -hmm. I'm talking to you guys and there's no feedback, there's no conversation, like even now on the Zoom call, if we don't have a pause. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that me? No, no, one second. Am I good? Okay, Corey, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> Man, this is, that's my, um, so earlier this week I had, I was on a Zoom call with uh, uh -huh. GMs and with scouts from NBA and there were like 220 people yeah. it happened like five times in the first 20 minutes <laughs> and we we're like what and I see the guy the host he's like he's pissed off he's like uh -huh. <laughs> I'm like just just whatever don't think about it no we're good <laughs> we're good man I'm all good it sounds like you got zoom with like ad placement or something like that or you got commercials running in the background but we're we're good. And as a coach, you gotta have a sense of humor too. So like for me, <laughs> sometimes true. sometimes I put funny stuff, you know, like uh bloopers in, in the middle of a like really intense film session or something mm -hmm. where I know I gotta present film to a player. We've got clips of guys like tripping and falling over like the three point line, like they just trip, you know, tripped on air or like a sniper picked a guy off when he was going for a fast break dunk, he falls and lays, you know, lays on the ground for a little bit. We just put that in the film just so that, you know, guys don't get in there and get too serious to the point where, you know, we don't remember that we're human beings. So it's all good. But anyway, the last point I left off on is make sure that your players feel like they have a voice. Ask them mm -hmm. questions. And for you guys as coaches, take ownership. Sometimes I will admit to a player that, you know what, I need to do a better job within giving you drills or giving you things within pregame warmups that will help prepare you better for this situation next time. Like, I'll take a percentage of the blame. Obviously, the player is the one on the court. They're the most important piece of this whole process. But as coaches, we still have a job to do. And so the ability of your player, the success of your player, a lot of that is also based on the ability of you putting them in the right situations as a coach. So if you know you've been working with a player on a certain thing and, you know, it keeps coming up in the film that they're making that same mistake, you got to take ownership. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all in all, to answer your question, Bossy, just kind of yep. to bring it, it you know, to a conclusion is, is, you know, keep the players engaged by making it conversational. Be prepared. Take maybe twice the amount of time you would take to deliver the film session. Put that towards actually working on your notes, compiling what you're going to say. And even like if you have the opportunity to do it, editing your clips, like slicing them up, putting them in order so that it's clear. And, um, you know, make sure you have a theme. Make sure that it's a clear message, not, hey, let's talk about every single thing we did wrong. Let's boil it down to a few key points. Mm -hmm. And before I ask the next question, I just want to say the people who listen, uh, after when we're done, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. So you can raise the hand or just put it in chat. I see who you are. I can unmute you. And just instead of me asking it, you'll just – You'll go on live and you'll just ask Corey the question. Awesome. If you awesome. want to do that. So I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what needs to be done to make sure the players are engaged? <clears throat> Sorry, to make sure the players are yeah. engaged during the film session. So it, within a team uh, structure yeah. like ours, you know, here with uh, Bay Kong, we want to make sure our leaders can talk. You know what I mean? And it's especially important because we have a language barrier. You know, we have more foreign coaches on our coaching staff than Chinese coaches, you know, and all of our players are Chinese for, with the exception of, you know, the two or three foreign players. So a lot of times they have to wait for the translator to even like, you know, give them what Steph is saying, you know? And so with that constant, like back and forth, things can get lost in translation you can lose the emotion, you can lose the spirit, you know, of what's trying to be said. So it's like super important that our leaders who are Chinese have the chance, you know, within the team, whether it's a veteran 
uh, someone who's been experienced or just a player who feels confident enough to raise his hand, open his mouth and give advice. Like we have to give them the, the chance to do that. And I've noticed um, I had a, a, a rare opportunity in the last six weeks because we were quarantined and Steph was outside of the country. Um, coach J, our assistant coach, he was out of the country. They were stuck in America. They couldn't get okay. back here. And I, I was still here in China alone with the Chinese players. So mm -hmm. when I conducted film sessions, I noticed that when I allowed the players to come into an atmosphere where like I was asking them, what do they see? What do you think we should work on? You know, and then giving the leaders the opportunity to talk. It, it was a great film session. It was a lot better than just the times when we sat down and, you know, we're just rattling off all the things they need to do, you know. And, of course, there's simple things like make sure there's water, <laughs> make sure there's snacks if you can do so. You know what I mean? Nothing calms someone down and helps them relax than feeling like they don't have to worry about getting hungry or being thirsty or, you know what I mean? Like I even tell guys to pull out their phones not because I want them actually on their phone while I'm talking, but because if I'm giving you something that's important and I need you to remember it, put it in your notes in your phone. You know what I mean? So sometimes even causing them to like engage with me using technology or different things, it creates a better atmosphere. And I've done that even with young, like high school players. When I go to camps and I do clinics, like we have film sessions there, you know, for an hour, just so that they can get the experience of what it's like to be in college. Because you, most colleges, Division One schools, you're going to watch film all the time, you know. And if you go even higher, film is just a regular part of the game. Mm -hmm. And this, I feel that this is the key, what you said about technology, that you can have the phone with you. Because when, uh, even when I played in college, or before when I was playing in Russia, it was the, the rule that we had, no phones, nothing, you're not mm -hmm. allowed, you mm -hmm. just, you just yep. sit in like a robot. And I feel right. that it kind of puts the stress up a little bit. Oh, of course, of course. And, you know, that's the old school, like, no phones, they turn the lights off, it's super dark, you know, the, the AC is all the way up, so it's like freezing cold, and you got your arms in your sleep. Like, I played for a coach, man, who, we would sit in film sessions for like three, four hours after practice and weights, you know, during the week, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you still, you still had homework, you know, you had already gone to classes and you're not, and you're, you know, like, yeah, you're going to be tired. You know, there, there's no, there's no stopping, you know, just the natural feeling of this is a grind. So during the season we watch film, you know, sometimes we've been on a plane three, four hours and, we get to the next city where we're going to have a game and we go straight to the hotel room, the ballroom within the hotel room and we watch film. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the things that you pick up is just how to make sure that even within those times of being exhausted and tired, it's still a place of learning. You know what I mean? You don't want film yeah. to become like a punishment. You know, you don't want it to be something that players dread. You want it to be something that they look forward to. So you can do that. There's ways around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And how do you prepare to break down? Uh, how do you prepare for the breakdown before cutting down the film? Do you watch the game and put the notes or maybe even during the game when you're on the bench, you're already putting the notes like some time marks that when you go back and cut the film, you already know what you want? For sure. So during the game, um, I, I've kind of made myself the the stats guy, but I'm not the stats guy when it comes to like the things that you, you would think normally of stats. So I don't keep track of like points, assists, rebounds, turnovers, anything like that. I track the things that we as a coaching staff have decided kind of uh, help us get a win as a team. So we count stop streaks. So that's like, you know, if we can get three stops in a row, that's one stop streak. Okay. And we've kind of done a calculation where we, we kind of think seven stop streaks or more equals a pretty much good opportunity for us to win a game. If we can get seven or more stop streaks through four quarters, we can probably win because that's, that's 21 stops. You know what I'm saying? You're going to get some stop streaks where you get two and then they score, you know, one and then they score. So you really got more throughout the course of that game. But if you got three in a row, that's pretty great. Four in a row, five in a row, like, that means you're locking up for, you know, multiple minutes. So I track that stuff. 
But I also, in the middle of the games, if I feel like the momentum has shifted or there was like a big costly turnover or even if a guy made a great move, you know, we've been working on a right to left crossover into a step back and he does it in the game. And we've been working on that for the last two, three weeks. I will quickly like put an asterisk, put a star and then write that down like, you know, Drake made a great right to left cross into a step back, but he missed the shot or he made the shot. And I'll try to, yeah, put a time stamp like it was, you know, the third quarter with six minutes on the clock, something like that. So when I go back that same night after the game, I know where to at least look if I want to just hurry up and clip that one thing and then airdrop it to Drake on the plane or, you know, send it to him through, you know, text message or email. You know, those things help your process become a little bit easier. But for all you guys who are coaches, skill development trainers, and maybe you don't work with a team, maybe you just train, it's going to be harder for you to maybe like go to a lot of games physically and take notes. So this information is universal because it even applies to you guys who maybe you just have to watch video. So for me, even if I'm only watching one player, I'll watch the entire game. Why? Because I want to see the pace the tempo, and just the, the feel of the game. Like, I want to know how his two points in the first quarter, within the first minute, factored into how the whole team reacted. I don't just want to say, you know, hey, great move right here, or great pass right here, or you missed the roll man on the side pick and roll here in the third quarter. That's great. But anyone can do that. Anybody can watch film and just, like, pick out all the good, and pick out all the bad. That's why there's highlight tapes everywhere. Bleacher Report, Who Mixtape, Ball is Life. Like, trainers are doing that stuff nowadays and putting it on the ground, and they feel like they're doing something when really they have no idea on how to really break down film. That's not film breakdown. That's not analysis. Making a highlight tape, my mom can do that, and she knows nothing about basketball. She can literally just, oh, he made a shot. <laughs> Clip that. Oh, he passed it to that guy. That guy scored. Clip that. Like, come on. So if you're going to be a coach, get the tempo, get the feel, get the momentum. Like, were we down six? And then he made a big shot that led him to us now going on a run. Did that still spark, you know, some energy from the rest of the team? When, you know, he, he uh, made that three in the corner. Was it a three that we didn't need? He, even though he made it, it was the wrong shot. We should have ran clock. Right. We should have took some more time off the off the clock. Like all those things come from watching the game. It's not, you know, hey, success, failure, success, failure, good, bad. No, you got to watch the game. So for me, I, I sit through it, man. The only time I wouldn't watch an entire game is if I watched a player who uh, came off the bench. You know, so okay. I, we have guys here. Yeah, they, we have guys here that I know when they're going to get in the game. It's just because, you know, they're rotational guys. So uh, one example is a guy named uh, Shu Meng Jiu, but we all call him Shooter. Like, we just call him Shooter because that's what Shooter does. That's his job. Just focus on putting it in the hole, man. When you catch it, shoot it. You know, if he can't shoot it, he just passes and he waits for it. He's like Mike Miller, you know, uh, Kyle Korver, <laughs> J.J. Reddick. So I know Shooter is probably going to go in the game at the six-minute mark, you know, in the first quarter, or sometimes later if the starters are rolling. That's just how it goes. So if I'm watching his film to break down his film, I might watch the time before he gets in, but I kind of already have an idea that um, I want to pay attention to certain things with him because his role is this big, right? It can be this big if he's having a great game, but for the most part, he's really got to only focus on a few things. So with someone like that, let's say you're working with a kid or a player who they want to know how they can improve and get off the bench, right? They want to grow their role. Well, now, all you got to do is ask them, hey, what quarter do you play? What quarter do you get put in the game? You know, when should I start watching the film? They can tell you for the most part, oh, I didn't get into the second half. Or I didn't get into the last minute of the game. Okay, fast forward. <laughs> you know, we want our jobs yeah. to be uh, – <laughs> we don't want it to be easy to the point where we become lazy, but we also don't want to do extra work to the point where we could be more efficient. You know, so if, if you know you got a kid who, who's not playing a lot, or a player who's not, you know, in heavy rotational minutes, that's fine, understandable. But for a starter or a star, someone who's a big impact player, you got to watch even the possessions where they don't have the ball in their hands to know how they're affecting, like, 
everything else. Because sometimes one player can affect the mood of another player. They're, they're all intertwined. You know, those five players work as a unit. So when one player is, you know, not sharing the ball or playing selfishly, that's something that can go beyond just like film. That's an understanding of the game. That's IQ. You know, and that's what you want to be able to teach is IQ ultimately. Mm -hmm. And when preparing the, when breaking down the film, uh, what is the difference for you when breaking down the film for a team or for an individual player? So when breaking down a team or a player, first of all, I want to focus on the similarities, right? Similarities are based on principles like defensive rotation, help position, pick and roll coverage, player spacing, timing, execute. All that is the same. If you're going to uh, do film breakdown for a team or an individual player, you got to know principles. So I'm always going to tell an individual player, hey, if the ball is on this side of the floor and you're playing defense on that side, you need at least one foot in the paint or maybe two feet in the paint if you're, you know, too many passes away. That doesn't change based on if I'm breaking down a team or a player. You know, if it's pick and roll coverage on defense, if he's on the weak side, he has to tag the roller. I don't care if this is about offense and you don't want to see that stuff. You don't want to hear me talk about that because it's principle based. I'm going to focus on that. So those are the things that are similar. Now, the things that are different are technique, right? Individual technique, you know, whether it's dribbling, triple threat, you know, defensive footwork, your shot, you know, so form, footwork, your reads and decision making, uh, shot selection, pace. Those things are individual, right? So if you're breaking down film for one player, right, you can isolate a possession and then break it down to the shot within that possession if it's your player taking the shot and then break that down to, you know, where is his, his follow through? Is it eyebrow, you know, elbow over eyebrow? Is mm -hmm. his guide hand twisting? Is it flat? You know, where is his feet? Does he land off balance? Like, so the – individual player film should be like you're taking a microscope and just getting like closer and closer and closer to the thing you're examining if it's a team it's just more broad it's an overview it's principles you know if you work with a team like I do then you're you have to focus on execution so like I know our team's plays if we run horns or we run some type of uh, ATO out of timeout you know call I know what we should be doing. I know the timing and the, where the screen should be set. But when I do skill work with just players who hit me up in the sun, I see their plays. So, you know, break down, hey, you know, the timing's off on this play or your angles, I, I don't know. That's that coach's decision, not right? I don't have their playbook. So I have a lot. Hey, this action, it looks like you guys are doing right now. Your angle's a little off when you set your man up for the pick and roll. You see? So that's a universal thing. You know, that's just a principle within sideline pick and roll. I don't have to know your play. All I know is you're too deep. So he's just going to go over the screen with you. That's why it didn't work, bro. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it sounds simple, but I don't know. I think it's simple. I, I won't even say it's hard. It, it, as, as long as you understand – principles you can break down film on any level of basketball it doesn't even matter if you you aren't coaching that level like I used to pick out NBA players and I didn't know them I still don't know them <laughs> but I would pick out NBA players and I would break down their their film to practice and I would talk I would do like voiceovers like hey what's up Colin you know this is Corey Harris man I just want to you know let you know you know in your sideline pick and roll you're missing the roller like I would make it save it on iMovie, you know, and, like, upload it to my cloud and, like, keep it. Because I'm like, if I run into him, I got film. If I ever cross paths with LeBron James, I got film. But what it did was it, it gave me reps. It helped me practice, and I found my voice. You know, I found my confidence. I started watching other people. But you can do that, you know, just if you're watching a game or you go on uh, YouTube and you find a um, not a highlight but a, a full game, just break it down screen record the first quarter or, you know, a couple minutes of it and just go crazy. Just like try it out. So uh, that's what I think helps between uh, doing film for a team versus for an individual player. Learn the similarities between the two and then learn the differences between the two. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea about putting the voice. 
because yeah, really man. when you meet the player you already have you may have like a project of at least like five clips and you can show it to him and he'll be like what how yeah. why yeah. did he do where i'm ready i'm ready <laughs> exactly. if, I, if i get a job opportunity from like an nba team they're gonna look at me like i'm insane <laughs> I, like why, why do you even have this <laughs> why do you have this and so I wanted to ask, remember when we did the live on Instagram and you said the time when we trained together, so that was seven years ago or no, yep. eight years yep. ago, uh, you yep. were focusing a lot on just like some isolations where players were, were dribbling the ball and all that. And now you're talking yep. more about the concepts, about the angles for a sideline pick and roll. What would you recommend to people who don't understand yet the trends, who don't understand the spacing, what they should study? Wow. So basically, it's all about how you watch basketball. Um, if you watch basketball from a fan standpoint, like someone who just likes to see, you know, the highlights and all that good stuff, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, anyone can do that. So if, if that's your perspective, you're going to get trapped into that will then like help you formulate your training. Right. So when I like Bossy said, when I first started my business, I didn't have a lot of playing experience at the time. Right. So, you know, my perspective on the game was solely based on my, my small amount of experience as a player and also my perspective as a fan who watched the game. And so it was very simple for me to get out of that funk. Someone explained it to me. And basically what you have to do is when you watch the game, watch what happens when the ball crosses half court with everyone else that doesn't have the ball. And it, it blew my mind. Like, it, it – forced me to now begin to see that this wasn't a game of layups, dunks, and three-pointers. This was a game of, like, cutting, screening, spacing, spotting up, you know, moving, posting, like, all the beautiful things that are taking place off the ball. So, for instance, uh, if, you know, we were playing five-on-five five and Bossy brings the ball down the floor, unless we're all just standing still, there are things that happen every single time down the floor that allow Bossy to then decide what he's going to do, right? We might all just start in spots, the corners, the wings, the low block, the high post, right? Then after he initiates our offense with a pass or he dribbles to a spot, now these other things begin to happen. So now the same way that I was taught, all right, watch the four people off the ball when the ball crosses out of court. The next step was watch what the person does who just had the ball after they make the first pass. Okay. And so it's like, it's a continuation, right? It's like throwing a stone into a lake or into a body of water. It just continues to get wider and wider. The ripples continue to, to flow outward. And so offense is based on those principles, spacing, right? You want eight to 10 feet of space in between everyone on offense, unless we're screening, right? Like, or we're setting a ghost screen, like a fake screen unless I'm driving at you for a DHO, right? So if I dribble at Bossy and I'm on the wing and he's in the corner, he's going to come up towards me or he's going to cut back door to keep the spacing, right? So normally, unless we're screening or doing a dribble handoff, we're all spaced out. So, okay, I had to learn, like, I'm looking for spacing. Why are they moving this way or that way? If the ball's driven, where do people move? If he goes baseline, somebody slides corner. If he goes middle, someone fills up. If he drives at the guy in the low post, the guy lifts either to the elbow or he spaces the short corner. And I was like, man, those are drills right there. You know, that's a film breakdown right there. So, okay. And then I just kept looking for now angles. The, the game of basketball is played on a court that never changes. Right, it's a rectangle, obviously, that's split down the middle in half by the half court. The three-point line, it's not exactly a semicircle, you know, it's more like an oval, but those parameters don't change, right? They moved it in a little bit some years ago and then they moved it back out. But there's no four pointer or five pointer unless you're playing in the big three. So, you know, it's it's the same. If you just pay attention to angles on the court, you now can understand why someone like a Michael Jordan would drive to the elbow so much or would post up on the low block or would attack the midline and why Kobe would say, I'm going to copy Mike. Like, I'm going to do the same thing as him. So 
getting back to Bossy's original question, if you're trying to elevate and move on from just watching the game from a fan's perspective or trying to understand the game on a deeper, a deeper level, all you have to do is start paying attention to what the people are doing off the ball. And they all, within every offensive system or philosophy, they all mimic themselves. It's, it's normally the same. Someone's receiving an off-ball screen on the weak side. There's going to end up being a ball screen on the strong side, right? And either the person that's getting the off-ball screen on the weak side is either going to be cutting uphill, that means they're coming from the baseline to high, or they're going downhill from, you know, half-court area towards the baseline. So, like, it's, it's not a whole lot to get confused about. The confusion is just in, like, the order. So does it yep. start with an off-ball screen or an on-ball screen? Does it start with a cut? You know, does it start with the ball being thrown in the post first? You know, so basketball is a simple game, man. Like, it's, it's such a simple game, but it takes a genius to understand it. And I don't even know how that <laughs> statement makes sense, <laughs> but it does. And I feel like everybody kind of, you know, agrees with it. Like, you, you really never get it all because – Every time we think we got it, a new player shows us a new level. Like LeBron, like he's different, right? So we think we've seen it all with Mike and, you know, then another player comes and then Giannis comes and then Steph Curry, you know, and it's like, ah, you want to pull your hair out, you know, because you think you know how to break down film. Steph Curry shows you, nah, throw that out the window. Like you got to be able to shoot from 35 feet out, you know? So uh, I, I, I'd say don't ever lose the heart of a fan. You know what I mean? Like where you just love the game, but you do have to take that hat off as a coach or as just someone trying to break down something. You can't do it from a, a fan perspective. Mm-hmm. And when I'll be, uh, when I'll be putting the capture on social media, basketball is a simple game, but it takes genius to understand it. Should I quote Corey Harris? No, nah, don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> don't quote me, brother. Don't do that. You can take credit for that one. I don't want to get killed right now. <laughs> I'm and kidding, talking about talking about the length of the film, how long do you want to make it when when doing the the individual video for a player, just to make sure that player is focused through the whole video? The shorter the better, man. Let's keep it real. The okay. shorter the better, because uh, we live in a very uh, social media driven society. Everyone's attention spans are are you know decreasing. I mean, I was born before social media, and now I find myself like watching a movie and I'm like looking down at my phone like I'm like yeah I, I didn't grow up doing that you know what I mean we didn't even have cell phones <laughs> you know when I was a kid and now you know it's just a reality of life so I think that I don't even want to say that's changed though you know the best coaches do a great job of communicating difficult things and like complex things with like very small sentence structure like they can make something that's so hard to understand sound so simple You know, and that's a, I won't call it a gift. I'll just call it a skill. You have to develop that. And so when it comes to your film, if you can boil a game down into like two minutes worth of film, three minutes worth of film, even if it's five or six, you know, like if it's like those player evaluation films, I, I showed you guys that I sent to all of our players on the team. and I sent to Coach Marbury uh, during the quarantine. None of them were longer than uh, eight minutes. None of them. And okay. some of that time was like me just editing, like putting in, you know, music, and, you know, pictures and, you know, slow motion. The the actual content is probably no longer than four or five minutes. You know, so I believe that um, if it was me as a player, I would want to be approached a certain way and I would want people to respect my time, but also understand me. And so as a coach, I try to remember how I used to think as a player, man, I don't, I don't, I'd never liked those three hour film sessions I hated it with a passion I didn't look forward to it you know I hated sitting in the dark you know I hated watching my, my coach used to kill us we watched film with no music no sound no nothing just his curse words you know what I'm saying y'all motherfucking this and that and then it's like hey yo like how you expect us to sit through that you know like you can't get mad at us when we fall asleep so I never want players to think of it as a chore I want them to be like oh man thank you so much like When one of our guys tells me thank you for clipping, you know, stuff for him pregame or postgame, that means the world. Now, guess what? They're going to delete it or they're going to, like, forget that they even have it in their picture gallery. 
So don't get too attached to the films you, you're making. Like half the stuff we do, it's used today. And then it's like, you know, most players, unless you, you're working with the next Kobe Bryant, like most guys don't have that like continuous hunger to like study themselves and constantly get better. That's just the truth. But you can still give them something that will lead to like an extra hunger in their next workout an extra hunger in their next practice. Maybe they'll focus on that footwork that you put in the film because you, you worked so hard on it. And now they may never watch the film again, but they're working on that now every day. So it's, it's not even really about the film. Like don't, don't get attached to your baby. Like it's a, it's a creation. And, you know, you want everyone to just mm-hmm. throw a parade for you now because you did a great job on it. Like who cares if they don't like my future instrumental, you know, or they don't like the Drake backdrop in the background you know like that stuff doesn't matter you know I throw that in there just for a little extra spice but you know I I'm just glad that guys want to work you want to inspire the player to leave with like an action step right all your film should push them to want to take action I think that's the biggest goal for a clip so if it's 30 seconds long and it makes them want to take action you got them now, if you can go documentary with it on some wild junk and make Mike Last Dance type stuff, you need to be <laughs> working on movies. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you're in the wrong field. Don't work basketball. Go to Hollywood. But, you know, this ain't Hollywood. So just just keep it simple. Keep it short, you know, and, and try to hit them, like, hard, you know, right in the beginning. Don't, don't take too long to get to the point. You know, one thing I'm thinking, the – the players who become coaches when they experience those long video sessions are usually the ones who, who are preaching about short video sessions just because we experienced <laughs> it before. But the coaches who didn't play much or even like college or a little bit of professionally, those are usually going to be the ones who will want the longer ones just because they were not in the shoes. Yeah, man. Yeah, as as, <laughs> as, as as sad as it is to say, like, I'm not taking a shot at anyone who didn't have a, like, long playing career. I didn't have a long playing career. You know, I'm not going to get into my full story, but, like, I didn't play my first organized game of basketball to my freshman year of college basketball. You know, just go and figure that. You know, so in five years, you know, I got put through a blender, and I got the experience there, and I was a leader and all that good stuff. But I still learned, like, film sessions suck. You know what I mean? Like, they, they, they just suck. So it didn't take me 20 years of, you know, hooping and this and that to get to the point where I realized, like, as a coach, I don't want to do that. I think all I had to do was just say, you know what? I didn't like that. So when it's my turn, I'm going to do a better job. And um, if you're a coach and you don't have a lot of experience playing or you have no experience playing, that's still fine. Eric Spolstra actually started off working in the film room for the yeah. Miami Heat. And look at him. You know what I mean? He, he's won champion, three championships, I think. So, you know, I'm pretty sure he's not killing guys. You know, like Pat Riley was legendary for having like uh, all day type of like practices and film sessions and all just like he would make an all day event out of his teams being together, you know, in L.A. for training camp. He's legendary. He's known legend. He's a legendary guy for that. And he's Eric Spolster's GM and president. But Eric still had his own identity. So it doesn't matter who you are as a coach. You can't allow someone else to pressure you into thinking that, well, you know, it's always been done this way, so you got to do it this way. No, like, put your, put your own style to it. Keep your identity intact. And always listen to the heartbeat of your players. If your players give you feedback and they tell you they love something, that's normally a good way to go. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to love everything you do or that you should always care about if they like it or not. But if you're trying to do the right thing, you're trying to help them, and they tell you they appreciate it, then there you go. Mm -hmm. And talking about communication, how would you show negative clips to players? Uh, What would be the ratio or just how would you communicate? Well, man, you just got to do it. I think the younger you are, the harder it is because you want players to like Mm -hmm. you. Like that was something I struggled with when I first started my business. And uh, I was, you know, sending film breakdowns to, like, professional players that I was working with, guys who played overseas. And, you know, I was like, man, I don't want to lose this client. You know, I, I kind of was a little scary, you know, because, you know, dude is 30 years old, you're 22, 23. 
he's got kids. And at the time I was still living with my mom. So I'm like, you know, he's got more life experience than me. What do I look like telling him, you know, man, your left hand sucks. You know, you're, you trash when you go left, bro. Like, so obviously you have to find a way to express what it is they need to know in a way that they can digest it. And so I, I take on the sandwich method. That means I give them a positive, a negative, and then a positive, you know? Uh, so okay. if, let's say a guy turns it over, you know, I've got clips, you know, of some of our guys in practice, a rookie point guard I'm working with. I think I referenced him before. We call him Drake. That's his English name, but his Chinese name is Meng Bolong. So Drake, he gets nervous in practice, man. And, we always study his film so he can kind of get used to seeing things before they happen now so he can see the coverage. So when I watch film with him, I'll tell him like, man, you did a great job of having pace and getting the ball up the floor because he, you know, he dribbles the ball up pretty quickly. That's good mm -hmm. for a point guard. So that's my first layer of the sandwich. That's the bread. It's a positive. Now, right in the middle, that's the, 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 the ish I got to give him. It's the bad. So I'll say, but right here, Drake, you were out of control, man. You, you over-penetrated, you got in the paint. Now you couldn't pull it back out, and you got stuck in the trees. And so you threw it straight to the defense. That's the middle. And then at the end, I'll say, but look, like I said, your pace is great, Drake. Like, we got to keep getting the ball up the floor. But we got to make sure that we get to a point of, all right, let's pull it back out to the wing, or let's stop above the three-point line and call something. You got to call a play. So I gave him some positive, I gave him some negative, and now he's like, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. I didn't just like kill him. I didn't just, you know, <laughs> how, how could you turn it over like that? It's so stupid. Like, you're a CBA point guard. What are you doing? You should learn that in middle school, dummy. Like, I'm not gonna do that to him. You know, I wouldn't want anybody doing that to me. So, you know, when communicating a weakness or something that's wrong, you gotta tell him the truth. You just have to get over yourself. Stop worrying about if they're going to like you or not. That's not your job to be liked. It's your job to be a teacher. It's your job to help. So you got to give it to them straight. But we all know none of us like to hear bad news just raw unless, again, you're working with someone who really wants to be great. And so they don't really care. They're just like, bro, you know, what do I need to get better at? Mm -hmm. So those players are rare. And it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to work with them because the work is so much more efficient, right? But for the most part, sandwich method, that, that's how I rock. Um, again, I'll empower them. I'll ask them questions. Hey, what do you see here? And I know this is a play where they screwed up. But I'll be like, well, what do you see right here? What, what should you have done better? And now that player, they get to the same solution that I was trying to get them to. But they did it on their own. And normally when people learn things on their own, they never forget it. You know, my mom used to be like, I swear I told you that a million times. Why is it that when so-and-so says it, you believe it? I told you that. And it's like, well, they're not my mom. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't like listening to you. I wouldn't say it out loud because she smacked me, but that's really what I was thinking. You know, <laughs> they're not you. I appreciate them saying it to me. I know you're going to say it, right? Or, hey, I learned this on my own. I needed to have my own time to figure it out. Players want to figure things out, too. They don't want to be babied. They don't want to be coddled. And sometimes you're babying them by actually always giving them the answers. You know, so I'll even give them film with no voiceover. None. No, no text. No words. Just so that if I sit with them, we're watching it together, even though I've studied it, I know what they're about to see, but they can say like, oh yeah, right there, man, I should have cut back door. My man had his head turned, I should have went back door. And I'm like, yeah, you should have. You know, and my job's easier. My vocal cords aren't strained, you know, I can sit back and you know, like it, it's pretty simple that way. So uh, that, that's my method, but the greats want to be pushed. Good players want to be told how they can get better. Right. So sandwich method, the greats want to be pushed. So you can just be straight up, raw, authentic to the point with them. And you'll know when you're working with a kid or a, an adult player that wants to be pushed. Like they just want to know. Give me the truth. Mm -hmm. and do you feel that uh, working with the vets, they're able to tolerate more criticism? They're able to tolerate more <laughs> negative rather than the younger ones? Not all the time. Uh, for the most okay. part, I would say, yeah, 
because you don't get to playing, you know, five, six, seven, eight years in a professional league. You don't get to that by being soft for the most part. Most of them, they had to really, like, pay their dues, earn their spot, earn their time, just fight, you know, to get to that point. But I will say this. Some veterans, they are used to being uh, stars. So, like, you know, we've got guys on our teams that make a lot of money, you know, and they're in front of cameras. They have endorsement deals. They are followed, you know, wherever they go. If people see them in public here in China, like, they mob them, right? So they're used to people basically telling them what they want to hear. And and maybe at first you have to earn the respect of that guy just to be able to talk frankly with them, to be straight up with them. But sometimes even if they respect you, you know, they, they're just used to being right. You know, so that's a rarity. Most, most really good players, most veterans, they want to hear it straight and they're okay with it. But I've ran into some veterans that cannot take constructive criticism. They just can't. Like, they, they break down, they make excuses, or they, someone else is always to blame. And so with those guys, I generally let them leave the film. I just kind of know how to play it. Like, you show them a play, and you say, hey, what happened right here? You know, and you let them talk it through, and you're like, oh, okay, well, you sure? Like, what else do you see? And then they just keep talking. And then they eventually get around to like, you know, admitting like, oh man, that was just a bad pass. I could have just, I could have just thrown a, a lob right there. And it's like, okay, <laughs> not I told you so, because you'll lose them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's literally like feeding a baby. <laughs> you ever watched a woman try to like feed a baby? Like she has to like, you know, uh, yeah, it's, uh-huh. it's, it's so much, it's so much like extra stuff that goes into that. You So I would say most of the time veterans are great, but I'm not going to name names, but yeah, veterans can be tough, bro. They can be tough. Okay. Okay. And how do you, how do you motivate players through the film? Maybe you show their favorite players or least liked opponents, somebody whom they hate playing in the court. So yeah, I'll, I'll show players, you know, clips of uh, Kyrie Irving executing, you know, whatever move they they're trying to do or, you know, Steph Curry or, you know, Pau Gasol, like I'll go back into archives and I'll try to actually motivate their interest in the game rather than always getting them someone that they've seen before. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, you know, the fun thing for me is like, like I said, my business is called Student of the Game. I like the fact that with YouTube, we can go and like look up all types of guys from different eras, different generations, and like see how they parallel with the game still to this day. So, like, instead of getting clips of Steph Curry, which everyone has seen, I'll get, like, Chris Jackson, you know, Mahmoud abdul Raouf, and, you know, show a guy, like, one of our young players pulling up off the bounce, like, bop, bop, and, you know, raising up over a defender. And now the fun comes because he's like, who is that? It's not so much about just our film session now. It's like, hold on, I thought I knew the game. Who? This dude has a Denver Nuggets jersey on. He's giving Jordan like 30. What is this? And so, you know, mm-hmm. now it's that it's that childlike fascination with the game. You know, it, it's not always just like, all right, let me go and find something really easy to compare what I'm trying to teach. Sometimes you got to like go back to that, I don't know, that heartbeat for basketball and like really get creative and dig up some stuff, man. Like I like working with bigs because working with bigs is a lost art right now. And, you know, everybody's kind of sliding more towards the guard game. But, you know, a lot of people don't know great bigs, you know. So when you pull up clips and you find international bigs and, of course, the, you know, the Mount Rushmore guys, big name guys, but, you know, just all the different types of players, you can branch off into now tapping into that player's fascination just with learning the game. So even for me being here in the CBA now, I'm learning about, like, the CBA's top 100, top 50, you know, or best of all time, whatever, you know, and that gives me more opportunity to say, okay, let me gather film on these guys now, you know, so that I can help these players relate to not an NBA player because maybe they're never playing the NBA, but they can look at someone, one of their countrymen and say, oh, I can do that, you know. So you got to get creative and motivate them in different ways. But I have used film of, like, uh, teams opposing players 
uh, with like our with Kyle Fogg, our star point guard, to motivate him to lock him up, not to ever teach him anything. But I'll show him clips and be like, "Could you guard that man? He just killed that dude. You see, he dropped it. That's you. He might drop you like that." <laughs> and you know, he'll be like, "Man, please." You know, like that's what we did with Jeremy Lamb. Before the game, we we watched so much Jeremy Lamb as a team. Steph was just like, you know, man, he's fast. He's athletic. Look how he takes that contact. Y'all better not let him get loose. You know, and now when we played him, like, I think Jeremy probably had like eight going into the, the fourth, like the last four minutes of the fourth. And Jeremy is a great player. I'm not trying to knock him. But Kyle, man, he was all over him. He was he destroyed him. I think Jeremy probably went and got like six or seven points after Kyle finally got out of the game, like garbage bucket. But, you know, it was like seeking an attack dog on a piece of meat, you know, because the film, the film just like, he rehearsed it. He said he watched it like all night, you know, and that's what a great player does. They just, they, they use things that don't even happen. Like if you watch Michael Jordan, The Last Dance, he said he told himself lies. Like he made up a story about how a player talked trash to him. Mm -hmm. And he went and destroyed him, you know what I mean? The next day, he motivated himself to like hate this guy for 48 minutes. So if you can be a small part of that, sometimes that's a great thing to have as a coach is know how to push a button. It's like literally just taking a dog off the leash and then getting out of the way. Like, let's just watch what happens, you know. So if you can learn how to do that with your players, man, you can really help kids and help, you know, obviously pros, whatever level they're on, you can help them be successful. They can accomplish things that they probably wouldn't without your help. Next season, I'm definitely using that trick when, oh, have you seen that guy? It might be you on defense. <laughs> that will <laughs> work for sure. <laughs> for sure, man. For sure. for sure. And do you film practices? Uh, do you have maybe homework for players? For example, when when we train with Aaron, even those 20 minutes before after workouts, uh, I usually try to film just the way he moves. And maybe by the time we go back uh, from the gym back to the hotel, I'll show him the video and explain what he did wrong, how he should push off better. Do you think it's essential sure. for development to film practices too? For sure. Like I love the type of movement uh, specialization, you know, stuff you do, Bossy. I'm not as gifted as you or as skilled as you in that area. So, I, <laughs> you know, hats off to you, bro. That, that's, that's your lane, you know. And what I will say is, you know, if you know what you are – strong in like what's your strength what's your area of focus you know and you focus on that like you stick with it you can really do great in this game so for me I'm big on you know obviously we talked about it before but I'm I'm big on like spacing and concepts so like you know two man three man game you know what what we're supposed to be doing to manipulate the defense even just as one player how can you manipulate the five guys and so uh we film practice I I never uh, waited for, you know, Coach Marbury to say, you know, all practices will be filmed. And, Corey, you need to break down every practice. I, I never waited on him to do that. I would just go to the film guys, you know, who we have on staff, and, you know, with the help of the translator, or I would just develop relationships with them myself. And I would message them, you know, the night before practice and, you know, politely ask them to bring their gear. And, you know, they'll ask you, hey, what portion of practice do you want filmed? You know, do you want the whole thing? You know, and most of the time I didn't want that. I just wanted the scrimmage, you know, or I just wanted the live like transition situations we would play in. But all of that helps me, first of all, to stay engaged as a coach because I don't want to get in okay. practice and just go brain dead because I'm not running the show. Like typically if you're not the head coach, you're not saying much, you know what I'm saying? Unless your head coach empowers all of you to have like stations or for you to, you know, step in, or maybe you have certain responsibilities. For the most part, I'm pulling guys one at a time to the side, or I'm kind of just like, you know, giving them cues or reminding them of things as they're in the middle of drills or in the middle of a game. So for me, it's super important so that I can stay like focused and in the flow every day in practice to just go ahead and ask the film guy, hey, can you film it for me? So now after practice, I feel like I have something to do that actually contributes. So when we get on the court, our players actually practice better and play better in the scrimmages, which gives Coach Marbury more confidence. Now he can teach more. Now he can put in more plays. Now we can get more and more advanced in our reads and our wrinkles. 
verticals that we insert. But everybody has a part to play. And for me, film and practice is huge because it helps me to do a better job as a skill coach. I want to base all my drills off of what we do as a team. I'm not really being super creative and just like making up stuff. If we don't do it in a play or in an action that we run on the court, I don't teach it. I don't care if it's ball handling. I don't care if it's like some type of footwork or finishing. Like if it doesn't relate to the game, I'm not doing it. Now, there's certain things that build up fundamentals, you know, so stationary dribbling or some type of passing or, you know, using a tennis ball here and there, using chairs, like, that's fine. I'm not knocking anybody that does that type of stuff, but you got to film practice because that helps you to create now a time of experimentation. You don't want a player to experiment in a live game. I know that we tell players that, like, hey, you know, Go try what you've been working on in the game. That sounds good, but why not have them try that in practice? If a player is working on their game four or five days a week, they practice also four or five days a week. So those two things, yep. although they sound the same, they're actually separate because individually you're, you're working out, but as a team you practice. So why not take what you're doing as an individual, insert it in your team practice and scrimmages, the drills that allow you to – get to those same spots and do that move, you know, the situational stuff you might be doing if it's three on three. So then when you get into a game, it's rehearsed. The game should feel more like, uh, like, oh, I've already seen this before. I'm ready. It shouldn't feel like, hey, let me go out there and see what happens. Let's try something. Does that make sense? So yep. I, want, I want to film practices so that by tomorrow's practice, like, for instance, I filmed yesterday, Friday's practice, so that when we talk about it this morning, we talked this morning before we had shots, we had workouts. When Monday's practice comes back around, now if we scrimmage again and Kyle gets put back in that same situation or another player gets put in that same situation, they'll know what to do. And then by the time we play again, there's nothing for us to talk about. It's just like it's second nature. So if you're a skill coach and maybe you're not a uh, part of a team, uh, my advice is to go sit in on practices. When I was 23, 24, I started going to, like, local high schools. Uh, I would contact coaches, just cold call them. Bossy, I know you're big on it, man. You, you've been all over the world just visiting, you know, coaches. And, I mean, you've been in NBA practices, you know, Olympic team practice. You're, you're insane, bro, and I respect that about you. you. You do whatever it takes to learn. But anyone who's in this Zoom call, if you're not – at least tapped in with all the local organizations around you, you haven't just sat in on a practice, like, what are you doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's free knowledge right there. And you can film their practices, of course, with their consent, you know, ask them for permission. But that right there is an opportunity to, first of all, learn. Secondly, you can use what you get from video on their practices to potentially turn around and help their players their coaches might not be doing that. They might not be filming the practice. They might not be, you know, editing any film and, and giving it back to the players. So if you do it and then you catch one of the players outside, like let's say you come to another practice a couple of days later, after practice you say, hey, man, I just want to give you a gift. Like, you know, check it out. It's got some of your needs of improvement. Like whatever you want to say, you just give it to them for free, airdrop it to them to their iPhone. That player might say, hey, man, can we talk or you have a, a cell phone number or you got an Instagram, you got a Twitter, like that could turn into a relationship. It doesn't matter if it's Jimmy yep. Butler from the Miami Heat. He's going to want to learn because he wants to be the best. You know, and if you're not at least in the building, you don't have that opportunity. So I would say to any of you guys, like go to a practice, go to a local practice. But one of the first – practice I ever sat in on was uh, Dawn Staley, who's now a national championship uh, head coach and coach of the year for women's basketball in the NCAA. I went and sat in on her practices her very first year at South Carolina. I was working at a gym called the Imagine Center Sports Complex in Greenville, South Carolina. I drove hours to Columbia, South Carolina, just to watch their practice after I got like in contact with their assistant coach. And it changed my entire career. You know, just seeing the intensity as well as the connections that I made from that practice. So, you know, um, I, I hope each and every one of you in here, you know, has the opportunity to just be in practice every day. But if you don't, because maybe you're not affiliated with the team, you can still like 
work through that. You can still overcome that hurdle. Just find the team near you. Find the organization nearest you. Doesn't matter if it's high school and, and check them out. Mm -hmm. and last question that I have before we go to question and answer. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the series that you had? I think the first video was with Kyle Fogg. It was real work, real, real results. Do you think these sure. types of videos motivate players and they just show how what you do on the court when nobody watches, it really transfers to the game? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I've had the idea for a while to do, you know, a video like that. Um, I just always wanted to be different. You know, nothing against my peers, you know, my, my fellow skill development trainers, but, you know, everybody's making rap videos and calling them, you know, workouts. So I just kind of felt like that's been done before. And I'm not that good at demonstrating. Like, <laughs> I'm not Tyler Ralph. I'm not any of those dudes who can, you know, like play their players one-on-one -on -one and torch them. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's just keep it real. Some of us, you know, were good players when we were players. And now that we can't play anymore, we just can't play anymore. Like, this, how it goes. So for me, I say, you know what, like my players actually get better, though. And sometimes I don't work with really great players at first, but they like they, they really get better. They get real results. So I just wanted to, like, get the focus off of me as the trainer and get it back on the player. And uh, my main idea was to make sure that every clip that we pulled within the workout uh, video, like the Instagram video that you now see, it, it connects to something they actually do in the game to show that, like, this actually works, like, this stuff transfers. And uh, Drew Hanlon does a good job of it, too. There are some other coaches who do great, like Tim Martin down in Texas. He does a great mm -hmm. job with film and his workouts as well. Um, so it's not like I'm an anomaly, but, you know, I just felt like uh, as coaches, it's our duty to make sure that uh, when, we, when we train players, it, it somehow factors back into their performance. You know, and it, it needs to have something to do with what they're actually going to see. So, uh, yeah, that that's the first of hopefully a, a long installment. I'm going to be, you know, uploading more and more film. We just shot another video today. Um, Kyle is actually adding uh, turnaround jumpers into his game because after the uh, quarantine was over, uh, Coach Marbury came in with the idea to add uh, the triangle offense into our, okay. into our offensive philosophy. So I don't know if he was okay. inspired by the last dance or if uh, he was just feeling froggy. But um, so I've been racking my brain for the last uh, four weeks now with coming up with ways to develop our players, whether it be three on all shooting drills, you know, even if it's an individual workout, just basically teaching them how to play out of the triangle, how to get in post up situations, how to pass, how to read the defense. And so Kyle has actually been killing over the last two, three weeks in practice getting to his spots and actually playing out of the post. But we've been working together for six weeks on his post up. And so we started from here and it's literally like we're inching. Like he's not, you know, MJ fadeaway and on people yet. You know, it's like, <laughs> catch, you know, just turn around, up fade, you know, oh, I got him lay up, you know what I mean? Turn around, not fading, just pulling up, you know, up, shoulder fake, you know, turn around, pull up. So, we're, we're getting real results because it's real work. It's, it's no flash, no fluff to it. Um, but I, our goal is for him to become the greatest player in the CBA. It's a lofty goal, but, you know, that's, that's the journey that the videos are hopefully going to take all of us on. Hopefully it's, it's going to actually chronicle that, him rising to that, that level of greatness. I think he can do it. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for it. I haven't watched him a lot this year, but last season when he was with Guangzhou, he, he was nice. Yeah, yeah. He's changed a lot. He's he's more about, you know, obviously he's always been a winner. He wants to win, but, you know, you got to know how to make winning plays. And uh, <clears throat> playing under a great coach like Steph, who's won, you know, three CBA titles, you know, he, he knows how to play within the, the Chinese, you know, the culture, you know, the way that they understand the game and making them feel involved. So he's mentored Cal a lot. And he's been big for his growth just up here, you know, mentally. And the rest of us, we just okay. try to do our best to help him stay better physically, you know, stay on a high level. So he, he could do it. He's a two-way player, which is great. He, he locks up and he can go and get buckets. Okay, got it, got it. Well, that's time for us to open up the Q&A section. Uh, anybody who wants to ask Corey a question, feel free to tap in the chat and type your question. While you're typing it in, 
I'm asking mine, a quick one. I always ask that one. You probably, I don't remember if I asked that one when we went live. Uh, how would you teach the floater? Would it be more of a push for you or follow through? Oh, man, I was, a de I was definitely a push guy when I played, and um, I still teach it that way. I think that when you follow through, it's, it's a runner, which gives you more control, which gives you more backspin, which allows you to have more touch. Like if the ball hits the rim, obviously, you know, you want it to have that backspin so that it can kind of bounce around, you know, um, they call it shooter's roll. But if I palm it and I just kind of push it, it helps me to actually get it higher over a, a weak side defender, like a seven footer who's closing out, recovering, trying to block it. So um, I think you give up a little bit of that height and just that like crazy arc when you try to, you know, follow through on a floater but you also lose a little bit of the control when you push it. So, you know, for each his own, you got to figure out what works for you. If you watch a guy like Steph Curry, he pushes it because he's all about trying to just get it out of his hands as fast as he can. But if you watch a guard like C.J. McCollum, C.J. McCollum can shoot shots literally like running in the air. Like he'll just be dribbling and like jump from the three-point line and will fall forward and just like let it go. And he's like almost like laying laterally and he's got so much control on it because he, he's shooting it while he's moving forward. It's like Pistol Pete, like Pistol Pete would kind of shoot runners like that and floaters like that where he's literally holding it like this and just, you know, just shoots it mm -hmm. on the move. So um, it's about what you want to emphasize. You know, I can't, I can't knock anybody for teaching it either way. I just believe that uh, you have to definitely know what you're talking about. So I try to give players both. That's my belief. Like, I teach shooting a, a floater with a push as well as a follow-through, but I call them by different names. I call that one a runner, the follow-through, and I call a floater a push. Okay. That's a good idea. That's a good idea, actually, just so players can differentiate, too. Yeah. Just explain it. Tell them why one is good and why the other one's good and let them shoot. That's what I believe. Would you work on floaters with, with the bigs, too? Oh, yeah, yeah, like every day. We do uh, daily vitamins. So, like, for 30 minutes before practice, you know, I tell guys I'll be in the gym. You know, we start at 3.30, so I'll, I'll be there at 3. And they know which basket I'm on. It's a, like, multi-court uh, practice facility. And so we use two courts. But I'm on one basket for those 30 minutes while Coach Steph is doing whatever he wants to do. And uh, whoever wants to come down, we, we take our daily vitamins. So, you know, that's – getting to the basket, finishing, and they all do the same finishes. Now, I might add hooks, you know, for the bigs as well. But, you know, everyone's shooting floaters. Everyone's doing euros. We're doing jump stops. We're spin moving. We're reverse, you know, reverse layups, you know, contact finishes, veer finishes, wrong foot finishes, you know. I, I think the game is, is universal to a degree, you know. So mm -hmm. if you can finish off either foot with either hand, you become a universally good player who can play in any good system. So and what, what about weak floaters? What about weak hand floaters? Would you still do that? I think that they have or? a place. Yeah, okay. I think they have a place. Um, I teach them, but I also encourage players to, if it's a drill that's timed or like we keep a score, I tell them like I get it. Like I understand if you're dri you're driving left and you shoot a one step floater going back to your right, that's actually like a, a very skilled shot to drive left yeah. and then be able to float it with your right. That's tough. But you see Manu Ginobili and all types of, you know, international players who exposed us to that type of footwork, you know, they, they've done that over the years. So um, I get it. It has a place. But if we're trying to just develop your game, you know, it's a, it's a setting where this is all about teaching and you getting better. Hey, man, go ahead and struggle for a few minutes. You know, I'm not mad at you. <laughs> Mr. Miss, miss Float, <laughs> we're good. That's why we're here. But in the game, don't shoot that bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, if you, you can't make it 8 out of 10 <laughs> going left in a gym with no one. Nope. Don't shoot that bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> nope. drive left, float to right. Drive left, shot fake, step through, you know, finish with your right. Mm -hmm. I'm all for success, you know, when the lights are on. So, stick with what works. Okay, we got the first question, finally. So, uh, that's, that's from the player. He's, play he's Russian playing in Germany in one of the youth okay. leagues, how to gain much game experience during a small amount of time. Uh, I guess when you don't get a lot of playing time, that's what he means. Yeah. Could film analysis yeah. be helpful or is it better to just focus on playing as much as possible? 
No, I'll combine them. Combine them both. I can speak from experience. My first year of college basketball, um, I didn't play a lot. Matter of fact, I was at the end of the bench. I probably sat on the opposite end of the water cooler. You know, people didn't even know I was on the team. Yeah, I just had the, the jumpsuit on. So my freshman year was rough. But um, actually, I passed a lot of my teammates and developed a lot quicker because I watched film. And I wasn't on the film. Obviously, I didn't play. But watching the film is more than watching your touches. It's understanding the mind of your coach and knowing what he wants or she wants. And it's also understanding where your teammates are going to be at and what they like to do and just what the defense is going to do when, whenever the ball moves. So by studying film, even while I wasn't playing, it helped me to learn my playbook. It helped me to understand the things that my coach didn't like from the guys at my position so that I wouldn't make the same mistake and help me to understand where to be so that I could be more successful when I played. And it's a skill. Like, watching film is a skill. You have to get used to, like, not falling asleep, not slouching back in your chair, you know, sitting up straight. You have to get used to watching film with a notepad, you know, and not just sitting there with your phone out and, like, casually scrolling and doing things. Like, you got you to gotta get some discipline. So it's important. Now, to get more experience on the court, you need to play. So if you don't play a lot in games or scrimmages, here's my advice. And this is what I did. So this is real life advice. Play everybody one-on-one -on -one after practice. If you get your ass bust, you're getting better. If you win, you're getting better because you're playing. Like you, you're not going to get in. So like play, hey, you know, check up. And I mean, I would check up the best player on the team sometimes and he would kill me and it'd be like, I right, let's play again. He's like, what? And I'm like, come on, let's play again, you know. And we would just go <laughs> until he got tired of beating me. And then the next day I'd go to somebody else. And then once I figured how to play each guy or I figured how, you know, how to not let them rip me or block my shot, now, like, I could see the game started getting easier. I started getting tougher. I gained more strength, more balance. I could accept contact more. I made reads faster. But – if you're not going to play within the real game, you got to recreate that. So um, a big thing, obviously, is to play one-on-one, -on -one, but it'd be better if maybe you play one-on-one -on -one out of a situation. So, like, if you're a guard, come off a ball screen and then have the guy that's guarding you pick you up after you come off the screen. So, like, set a chair on the wing and then act like you're setting up the screen. And then the, the, the guy you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, he's behind the chair. He's like the screener's defender. So you're trying to, like, get downhill on him. You're trying to, like, turn the corner and beat him. Or you might have to drag him out to the top of the key, like an isolation on a switch, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and now you're playing one-on-one. -on -one. Or you might just throw it to yourself on the wing, catch it, turn, face up, and now you're in triple threat and you guys are playing one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe you put a clock up five seconds when you catch the ball. Five, four, three, you know. So now it's not just dribbling for 20 seconds, and that's not realistic. It's how the game is. You catch and you got to do something. You catch and you got to shoot. You catch and you got to drive, you know. Those are the things I used to pick up from actually watching the U.S. Olympic team on YouTube. You know, they started, they started okay. posting uh, after the Redeem team in 2002, I think. That's when Kobe and all those guys played. And we, we, uh, we had the chance to win the gold in Beijing. They, they started putting all the practices on TV that year it was like a big deal like nike got involved and uh, they made a documentary series well they figured out that's big business people want to watch that so then in like 06 04 06 08 2010 and going forward what do you see now when you go on youtube if you type in usa basketball you don't even see like coach k talking and all the like medal ceremony you see like kevin durant paul george victor oladipo Kyrie. Ir like you see them playing one-on-one -on -one, because that's what gets the most views so Watch that video or those videos and look at how they're playing. They play from spots. They play from the blocks. They play from the high post. They play from the mid post. They play from the wings. They play three dribbles, one dribble, no dribble, right? All of those games teach you how to play and how to be competitive. So me and my teammates, man, we were getting fist fights. You know, normally it was my fault too, but, you know, <laughs> we, we will play. We play every day and – my, by my senior year, I was a second team All American. I was a team captain for three years, so it helped me. It helped me a lot. And my my team got to a point where they needed me to play well just for us to even even win. We couldn't win if I didn't play well. So 
one on one too was huge for me. It, it changed everything. But film, you put film with that, you're gonna be a monster. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And we got like five minutes left. Uh, I'm okay, not sure my if bad. Zoom will let us go longer. No, you good. If Zoom will let us go longer, I'll be more than happy. So one more question uh, from skills coach from Philippines. Uh, being a new skills coach for 12, 15 year old travel team here in the Philippines, teaching them through Zoom initially till we pick back up. How do you recommend programming youth kids? So basically, you, you got to know the experience level of all the players you're working with. Like, are they beginners? Are they intermediate? Have they played anywhere before coming to you? I think uh, from a, a basketball standpoint, age is not as important as we think it is. Uh, we can say, how do you teach 12 to 15-year-olds? Well, if you're working with a 12-year-old who's never touched a basketball, it's the same as working with a six-year-old. Keep it real. Like, they're just faster, just bigger. But from a skill standpoint, they haven't, they haven't developed. But you can also work with a six-year-old who's been dribbling, who's been doing drills, and be like, oh, my God, there is no way that this is a six-year-old. You know what I'm saying? So if they're – I think I just saw in the comments he said they're advanced. So if you're working with 12 to 15-year-olds that are advanced and you want to program them or help them go through a progression, just think about how it is you're actually going to help them fit into – what they will be doing as 12 to 15 year olds on the court. Typically at that age, you're just running fast break. All right. Like when I'm, <laughs> when I was 12, 12, 13, 14, 15, like the game is just like a track meet, right? It's a steal then a layup. Someone misses a shot. We get a rebound. We're throwing it ahead. We're getting a layup. Like you want kids to know how to like dribble with their left hand speed dribble, dribble with their right hand speed dribble, pass ahead with their right, pass ahead with their left. Maybe a little pick and roll, but the game's not really pick and roll yet. You know, it's, it's more like I'm passing, then I'm cutting back door. Or I'm passing, I go screen away. Teach them how to just space. Like, if you have two kids, one kid on the right wing, one kid on the left wing, and the kid on the right has the ball, and he drives baseline, where does the kid on the left go? Do they even know that? Do they drift to the corner? Do they stay put? Do they fill up to the top? Like, Teach them how to move off of the ball's penetration. You know, teach them how to be in the right place based on where the ball is. You know, those are the things that, that for me, when I work that age, like, it's huge. Like, just moving without the ball, reacting to penetration. And you got to teach kids how to make layups, man. Like, that's the most missed shot even in the NBA. I don't care how high you go. People miss more layups than threes, mid-range, free throws combined because – there's so much, like, so many hands up. It gets contested. There's contact. That's a tough shot, believe it or not. So, using a 12-year-old how to finish, inside hand scoop, outside hand, you know, a hook, you know, floater, shot fake, step through, spin move, euro step, like, bumping someone and finishing. Like, they instantly become better than everyone in their age group. Like, everyone. Think about it. Any 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old that you know who can make layups, like eight out of 10 times when they drive, they instantly in your mind are like, man, that kid's tough. Like, oh my God, you see that kid? Like, that was amazing. Like, even if they just do a up and under reverse layup, you're like, cause at that age, like most <laughs> kids can't control their body. You know, they, they go in there and they, they close their eyes or they get scared or they, they, you know, they get small, they shrink. So if, if you got a, a young group of kids, they don't really have to know how to shoot threes, teach them proper form. You know, teach them to have a sound base. Teach them how to slide their feet and spot up. Teach them how to, you know, go from a flare to then squaring up and shooting or curl and then square up, you know, like just teach them that stuff. But most importantly, they got to be able to run the floor. They got to be able to pass the ball. They got to be able to speed dribble with both hands, stop as well with the dribble, like change speed. You know, they got to be able to throw the ball into the post. And then they just got to be able to play off the ball and finish. Like, but it's, it's a simple game. Once they get that, you know, then you can start installing other things, you know, motion concepts and all that. But I would keep it simple. I don't really teach kids uh, step backs and all that stuff unless I feel like they've got the, you know, the foundation first. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Corey, thank you for your time and for your answers. The last thing, can you tell me how people can reach out to you? For sure. I think I've got 25 seconds. So I'm on uh, Instagram at Corey Harris, K-O-R-E-Y. H-A-R-R-I-S. I'm on Twitter. It's the same exact thing, Corey Harris. 
I even got a website, and guess what it's called? CoreyHarris.org. So it's pretty easy. <laughs> I thought <laughs> SOG. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm relaunching that soon, but everything's just under my name, man, so I'm easy to find. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you again for thank your you time, and thank you to everybody who tuned in. For sure, man. It's an honor. Hope you guys have a great day, great night. God bless. Yes, sir. Good night. All right.